right, so if you haven't noticed the pattern lately on the channel, we're, we're going a little bit random. And today uh, I'm actually finishing up part of uh, a new book um, that I have coming out on Chessable. It's called Openings Oddities. And it goes through all of the first moves that are not e4, d4, or knight f3. So we have a full repertoire for the English, Nimzo Larsen, uh, Polish Grob. Those, those are like the, the big ones. But I mean, I, I get into like the Amar opening, um, knight a3, the sodium attack. You got you to gotta love it. N-A, sodium, sodium attack. Um, but today, I wanted to give you a little taste because I'm actually going to have a full chapter on facing the Catalan that comes from the Binko opening, which is 1G3. And this is going to be a line from the text that uh, I finished up working on today. Um, we'll look at the side branches and everything. And I'll give you an idea of uh, what you can expect in the course. Um, it's going to run about the same price as my other uh, chessable books with the French and the Alakine. But, I mean... Honestly, just the sidelines alone, I'm very pleased with. But uh, I went in, I've got lines for the King's Indian Attack, lines for the Catalan. So there's there's a lot of bonus there that I think the average chess player is going to be interested in. So let's go ahead and jump right in and take a look. And as I stated, this comes from the Binko opening, which is 1G3 with a move order. And typically, I give uh, multiple options. Like, uh, I did suggest to play e5 against g3 in order to limit the options that white has. And it can also transpose back into the English lines. I recommend the Karpov structure against the English um, following uh, Karpov's games himself and adding improvements with modern engine analysis. But uh, if you play d5, like this is the specific move order with d4. And we recommend the open Catalan. And it's funny because, like, there's only really two Catalan systems that you can play against everything. One is the closed, and the other is the open. And, like, uh, some of you guys have a repertoire where there's, like, if white had d4 and c4 played with a king still on e1, you play bishop b4 check and then run the bishop back to e7, and you get a closed structure that way. Well, that's not a universal system because it can only be played under those circumstances with the pawns on c4. If you notice how white played in this game, the c pawn is still on c2, so there's never been any bishop b4 check. And this is the key moment where you actually tr choose whether you're playing the closed or the open Catalan. And after a lot of analysis, I, I just haven't been able to... Uh, prove advantages or even get a quality in a lot of lines versus the closed. So I started investigating the open and there's some messy positions at times, but they're quite interesting. They're dynamic and uh, we're going to look at a few of them here. So we're going to look at a, a rare sideline for white. We're going to call it the knight a3 gambit. And the f first and foremost, I, th I think it was recommended by Marin in uh, one of his books on from the Grandmaster Repertoire series on the English because he recommended a full English repertoire and this knight a3 move it was either a couple moves prior or right now he recommended it but it has the same typical themes there's two major memory markers for black here the the first one is at this moment if you do not capture the knight on a3 white is simply going to capture the pawn on c4 with the knight on the following move and all you've done is give up the center and given yourself a bishop that's going to be very difficult to develop. This is a dream position for white. So you must capture now. And then, as I was stating before, your bad bishop, is, it's horrendous here. So you've got to react to developing this bishop and doing something with him now. Otherwise, you're just much worse. So bishop d7 to get him working. 95 makes a lot of sense. Tickle, tickle on the B. Tickle, tickle on the B7 square from the open diagonal. So, so we're giving it away. And now we've reached the branching point where white has three real options according to theory. Um, and this happened just recently in the World Cup. So this will show you when I'm writing my texts, I'm actually using the most modern games I have at my disposal. And then, you know, just kind of 
pointing out like any updates and improvements that I can. That's one of the main reasons I love Chessable is because the books evolve over time. I mean, my Alakine book has been out for half a year now and I added two new trainable variations yesterday morning because I had a good question with a specific move order that we had missed. I'm always ready to go back in. And this line in particular with Bishop takes and Bishop G5, it just liquidates all the way to this ending. And after Rook C1, C5, this was seen in the now legendary preparation from Rajabov, who coasted through the World Cup this year to ultimately winning it, and then saying, you know, I really don't want to try to play for the World Championship. I'm giving up my spot in the candidates, which I, I thought that was like one of the most savage things of the year for chess players. But this is uh, an equal position, and seeing in that game, Zhang Rajabov from County Mansisk. <clears throat> it, they made a draw quite quickly. Uh, another line here is with the immediate e3. So both with e3 and the main line with 11 bishop b2, this is the key memory marker. Because if you notice, white when playing this variation has, go, has said, I'm okay with taking the doubled a pawns, but I get the bishop pair. So our rationalization with black is we have a pawn in hand on c4, we have the knights, which aren't as mobile against the bishops. So if I can get a position where I've given up one of my knights for one of his bishops, I'm a pawn up with a better pawn structure. So from that rationalization, we should have a plan. First, knight d5. And this is going to be the key memory marker move, shutting down the long diagonal and preparing to defend the c-pawn. Knight b6 is a critical move to hold on to that c-pawn in a lot of variations, as we'll see. So that's why it's so critical to remember knight d5. And after queen c2, tickle tickle on the pawn. Many moves have been played here, but I found it very interesting that the first choice of my engine was c3, and it's a novelty. And I was like, this looks sketchy. But then the more I looked at it, the more I was like, okay. So if e4, for instance, Knight takes d4, and you're done, son. Queen takes c3, knight e2 check, wins the lady. So that's easy to understand. And uh, what about if bishop takes d5? Well, I was just saying that uh, if he trades a b, then we just have the better pawn structure in the long term. Black's by no means worse here. And if he takes with a pawn here, I mean, he's almost busted after knight takes e5 because of subsequent knight f3 check ideas. And then the last line was with rook b1 keeping tension. The best of the bad options. Rook b8. Otherwise, black's going to play b5 and get that extension. And after queen d6, that's where I, I ended the line. Is black is holding everything in the position together nicely. And the main suggested move by the engine is going back to this bishop takes d5 idea, where we get the same type of position we saw in the first line. So, that covers e3. Now let's go to the main line with bishop b2. <clears throat> and again, knight d5. So there's two major moves in the database, rook b1 and rook c1. And this next move had only been played once, but I really, really like it. And it checks out with the engine, f5. Actively playing against the expansion of e4 and kicking our knights around. Our knight's great on d5, so let's keep him great on d5. Bishop a1 was played, tickle tickle on the b-pawn, so none of that, sir. He plays e4 anyway, and queen d6, that flexible move that we've seen in other variations, it pops up again. Knight b6 holds on to the pawn, and black was better in a correspondence game from 2009, where a 2100 beat an almost 2400 rated player. So that's a pretty good indicator that correspondence chess is nothing but engines playing engines at this point. And if a guy who, you know, is a solid 300 points lower wins with black, this is not a good position for white. Next up, we have the main line with rook c1. Well, knight b6, hold on to the pawn. And now two lines here, the first being e4. Rook e8 was a novelty in the position, and it's banking on the fact that white wants to play d5 at some point. It's going to get that rook in the game. So rook c2, queen d7, just slowly getting out of our bind. Rook a d8, all the pressure's in the center. 
and after queen c2, knight e7. Black's flexible, and he's looking to play c5 on the next move, and by no means, black is worse in this position. So lastly, after knight b6, e3. Again, we end with queen d6, where I cite the example game uh, Romanitian and R-A-Z-U-V-A-E-V. -E I'm definitely not pronouncing that Russian name properly in Moscow from 1983. So an oldie, but a goodie. So uh, that was a little, uh, little teaser from uh, the type of depth that we go into with uh, most of the lines within Openings Oddities. And I didn't mention that uh, Openings Oddities as well. My books have been pretty successful on, on Chessable from a financial standpoint. And, you know, it's, it's important that to me to make the point that, you know, if things are going well for you and you can give back, that you definitely should. So half the proceeds from this text, and it is October, which is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, will be going to, I believe it's the Coleman Foundation um, to, that uh, does cancer research because cancer sucks. It, uh, it's affected a lot of lives and maybe the book sales and the money we can provide could help. So that's that.